Yes. So, what was your first guitar? My first guitar was a, a famous uh, uh, cello-bodied uh, F-hold acoustic, uh, a German-made guitar, which my dad bought for uh, five pounds from a friend of his for me. Yes. How old were you? Ten. Ten. Yeah. And did you do? Did you play it? Um, uh, how did you learn to play? Well, the the guy that sold it to to me uh, was a, a guitarist, and he showed me a couple of chords he played in a show band at the time. My father was a promoter in Northern Ireland, so he knew this guy because he was one of the bands that played at my dad's dance hall all the time. Uh, and they used to play like you know top forty stuff in country and western, whatever. And the guy uh, was the lead guitarist in that band, so he showed me a couple of chords just to start me off, and then I kind of really learned from listening to records after that and books and asking other guitarists for uh, for help, you know, and stuff. <laughs> Did you play in a band fast? Or? I played in a band from when I was about 11. I had my first band, so <laughs> playing Beatles songs and stuff like that, you know. So that was that was where it all started for me, you know, the Shadows and the Beatles. And then shortly afterwards, uh, when I was about 13, the blues thing came along. Uh, you know, the John Mayer, Eric Clapton album, Blues Breakers <laughs> and uh, Peter Green, people like that. So I started getting into that. So from the ages of like, from the age of 13 to 16, really, all I wanted to play was blues. Uh, and then I joined my first professional band, Skid Row, when I was 16. And I w at first I was a bit kind of apprehensive about joining because they went to blues band, and I wanted to only all I, all I really wanted to play was blues. And I was very snobbish about it at the time. I didn't, I wasn't really interested in any other music. Uh, but then I kind of got to, um, I got to like the music that they were writing, and I got into what they were doing, and kind of opened my mind a little bit more. Uh, but it's always been in the back of my mind to come back to playing blues at some point. And uh, so you had an electric guitar at what point then? Uh, from when I was uh, about 11 or 12, I got like a, what was it, I got a <laughs> an Eggman's uh, Lucky Squire, a Ros Rossetti Lucky Squire guitar. Which was, it was like, a, it kind of looked like a Gretsch type shape, it was a uh, semi-acoustic uh, with F holes, it was a really, really terrible guitar. Nobody else could play it except me. Like guys of 25 years old couldn't play it because the strings were this high. So I learned to play on a very bad guitar, really. And then, of course, when I got a good guitar, my first good guitar, when I was 14, I got a Telecaster, and I was able to play really easily on that. And it, it, I found it uh, such a difference to play a good guitar. You know, I've been held back for so long that it, I was able to improve so quickly after that. But wasn't it Peter Green who helped Skid Row to get out some? Yeah. Uh, what happened was Peter Green uh, was playing with Fleetwood Mac at the time and we were supporting and we were opening for them in the, the National Stadium in Dublin, which is like a boxing ring, and they used to, they used to actually play on the boxing ring in the middle of the hall, and uh, the crowd, the audience would sit all the way around, you know, like that kind of a setup. And uh, so we were playing there, and uh, after we finished our set, the DJ, who was uh, announcing all the, the bands, uh, he came up to me and he said, Peter Green would like to meet you. And I said, oh, well, yeah, sure, you know, fuck off. I didn't believe him. I thought he was joking. And, uh, well, I went backstage and I was very nervous and everything because he was one of my big heroes at the time. And I'd seen him with John Mayle a couple of years before that. Um, so I went back and he said, I really like you playing. And he invited me back to his hotel and we jammed there and stuff. And we kind of got to know each other after that. And he helped us get like a, his, he, he asked his manager to bring us to England and get us a record deal and everything. So really I've got a lot to thank the guy for, you know. So, so you were playing blues at the time, though? You're, you're playing in Skid Row? Well, no. At that time, we were playing much kind of uh, more high energy stuff. It was kind of like a three, it was a three, almost like a, a three piece version of what King Crimson were doing in a way. It was a lot of breaks and time changes and stuff yeah, like that. Nice. Uh, but some of it was blues influenced, but it was a lot speedier than, than regular blues. We didn't do a lot of 12 bars or anything. Um, So the first musicians that you loved it was Eric Clapton, John Mayer. Yeah, and then Peter Green, and then uh, like Je Jeff Beck, Jimi Hendrix, all those guys that came along in the 60s, they were my idols, they were the people who helped me shape my own style later on. Um, and they're still the people that I enjoy listening to most. Um, how, when did you begin to write songs? To write my own songs? Yes. Uh, I wrote a couple of songs when I was in Skid Row, but the main writer in the band was the bass player, so I was kind of overshadowed by him. I didn't have a lot of confidence about my own songs, mostly because they weren't very good at the time. But I used to try and write songs every now and again. Uh, and I didn't really get into writing my own stuff until... I, I had a band when I was about 19 after I left Skid Row. 
and I wrote a lot of material for that band. But again, it was nothing special. What was the name then? It was just called the Gary Moore Band, but we did it. We, we only did one album called Grinding Stone for uh, CBS Records at the time, and that was like in the early 70s. And then uh, I, I joined Thin Lizzy for the first time, and I started writing a few more things. Then with Phil Linnett, you know, I started getting into writing with him, uh, and then from then on, it kind of grew. But I, I suppose I didn't really write seriously until, you know, until really I started my own career, you know, all over again. When I kind of started in the early 80s, then I had to write everything myself. I didn't have anyone to write with. So I was kind of, you know, I had to come up with an, an LP's worth of material every year. So I had to really start writing a lot more than I was used to. Because even when I was with Coliseum 2 in the 70s, I was writing with other people. I was writing with Thorn Area, and I didn't have to come up with all the material. We did it between four people. Uh, but when it was my own band, of course, then I had to write all the songs. So I suppose since the beginning of the 80s, that's when it really started to take it a lot more seriously and spend more time on my lyrics and melodies and stuff. Now, do you do you consider that the more, most important part of you is the guitarist or the singer or the songwriter? Uh, well, the guitar has always been the most important thing, I suppose, because that's what was there first. But I realize now that I have to sing and I have to be a songwriter as well, so It's all part of the same package, really, you know, and uh, I don't really think about them separately anymore. I just think this is what I do. I, I play the guitar, but I also sing and write songs. That's the way. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, as, a, as a guitarist, it was so all the, the blues, the heavy blues players, uh, the British blues team that mm. influenced you. Yeah. Um, I mean, first of all, the Eric Clapton uh, album that really kind of changed my ideas about uh, about guitar playing. As a, as it did a lot of people, yeah, it changed a lot of people of my generation's ideas about guitar playing overnight. I mean, that album in its day had the same effect as the Van Halen first album did later on. You know, that was yes. that was my Van Halen album when I was a kid. So uh, it just had such a great impact on people because no one had heard a guitar sound like that before. Just the sound and just the uh, the feeling and the aggression that was coming from it. No one really heard a guitar being played like that before. So um, overnight, everybody wanted to get a Les Paul, you know, and everyone wanted a 50-watt Marshall, and it sort of developed from there. And I couldn't afford either of those things. So uh, it was very frustrating for me at the time because I couldn't get the sounds, you know. I, I couldn't afford the equipment to get the sound. And I was trying to play this stuff in a Telecaster with a 10-watt box amplifier, and it just didn't really work, you know. So I had to save up and try and get a better amp. And, I couldn't wait until I could get a Gibson. I was really uh, excited about being able to get a Gibson and a Marshall, which I did later on. But uh, in the meantime, I had to sort of make do with bad equipment. Uh, when the Hendrix album came along, you know, are you experienced? And that was that was another big kind of milestone for me. That was a real, you know, I'd never heard anyone do that. There was all these great guitar players coming out of nowhere, and like Jimi Hendrix just sort of blew everybody away because he took the guitar so f much further than anyone had ever taken it before. Um, so, there was, I mean, it was a good time to be playing guitar, really, you know, the late 60s, it was a good time to be learning because there were so many great players around. And in a way, it was better than the way it is now because each of these players had a very individual style, you know, you had a very clear-cut idea of what you could do, and uh, you didn't have all these clones like you have now, you didn't have so many people playing the same way as you do now. Uh, you know, the guitarists of that day had a, had a much more individual character uh, and a much more um, individual style. So it, it was definitely a good time to be playing guitar. And as a songwriter, uh, who, who um, do you consider as the, your favorite songwriter? Favorite songwriter? Oh, good. <laughs> well, I like all kinds of people. I mean, I love the Beatles. I love Lennon and McCartney stuff, and I like George Harrison stuff. And I liked, uh, you know, over the years I've listened to many different types of songs. I used to like a lot of what Jack Bruce wrote after he left Cream. Mm -hmm. You know, his solo stuff, I liked a lot of his melodies and the strange kind of chord sequences that he used because they were very different from what other people were using. I liked um, Johnny Mitchell as a songwriter. I liked Van Morrison. I liked uh, Stevie Wonder. All kinds of people, really. And then on the musical side, just as, a, as composers, I liked, um, you know, what John McLaughlin was doing in, in the 70s, you know, with Mavis Lee. Because, I mean, that's why that band was able to survive a lot longer than other fusion bands, because they were actually coming up with very strong material. It wasn't just the fact that they were great musicians, the guys were writing strong melodies, and the same with Chick Corea. Um, so, I mean, good, there were a lot of different styles influencing me over the years, and uh, I was listening to lots of different types of people who wrote songs, people who just wrote music, and, you know, somewhere along the line, it all goes in there and comes out the other end, you know.
Um, so how, how how came to you the, the idea of a blues album? I mean, the the idea was in you, but to realize to realize it. Well, at the end of the last uh, tour, I was getting kind of bored with the the cycle of of going out on the road for six months, then coming off the road for two years, and spending a year in the studio, and then this whole process was just starting to bore me, and it was starting to show up in the music. It was making my music repetitive, and it was making it feel very stale for me. And I wasn't uh, as excited about it as I wanted to be, so I just thought it was time to do something different. And as I said earlier, I had it in the back of my mind to do a blues album for a long time, and I thought that this would be a good time to do it. But I didn't think the record company would think it was such a good idea, and I didn't think my manager would think it was such a good idea, but surprisingly they both were very uh, behind the idea. They liked it, and they thought they were very encouraging. Uh, so it was great. I was able to do what I wanted and uh, just get some musicians together and just go and play whatever I felt like playing. It was, it was it was a good thing to be able to do. Did you think of the the reaction to, to that to what that album could uh, could have um, like uh, like bringing uh, heavy metal fans to blues or uh, well it'll either bring them to blues or it'll turn them off me one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> But I think you know it's going to surprise some people and I think you know maybe we'll bring some new fans and maybe we'll lose some fans I, I don't know I didn't make it for the fans I made it for me this is my record you know and if they like it they like it if they don't then it's, it's the way it is but it was something that I wanted to do and it was a good thing for me to do and it was the right time to do it so that's the important thing right now I didn't think of any market or how many it was going to sell and, you know but sometimes that's the best way sometimes you know if you're too worried about how many records you're selling then you're not concentrating on the music you should be and that's what was happening to me I was starting to think about making product instead of making music and I, I've seen that happen to too many other people, too many other musicians so I decided that I'd put a stop to that before I became too successful <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, uh, <laughs> um, uh, well yes by the way the song moving on isn't yeah. it about that that uh, feeling like you want to change this time? yeah maybe it is I mean You know, there's a funny thing with songs. I don't know if you've ever written a song, but when you write songs, they just come from nowhere a lot of the time. And you don't know what they mean at the time, but you look at them six months later and you think, oh, yeah, now I know why I wrote that fucking <laughs> song, because that's how I was feeling at the time. And I've found that with a lot of the things I've written, uh, you know, that later on I, I look at the lyrics and I go, oh, yeah, that actually, yeah, that kind of sums up how I was feeling at that particular time. So it could be that that's what it was about, or it could just be, you know, that I just wanted to write a real cliche blues lyric. I don't know. <laughs> Hello? Oh, just a moment. <laughs> anyway, yeah, you know, that, that song, uh, it just came out of nowhere, and I, I wanted to write something, you know, with a more country blues feel to because, you know, I was trying to do things on this record that I'd never done before. Apart from it being a blues album, I just wanted to make sure that I didn't, you know, start repeating what I'd done on the rock albums and make it sound like just a heavy metal guitarist playing blues, because I didn't want it to come out like that. I wanted to make it sound like I was at least half serious about it, you know. Um, so, how, how did you choose the songs? Um, well, at the end of the last tour, uh, I just got together with this guy, Andy Pyle, who's one of the bass players on the album, uh, and a drummer called Graham Walker, who plays on most of the tracks. And it was just the three of us to begin with. And we just played through old favorite songs of ours, you know, things that I grew up listening to. You know, we played through a lot of the John Mayall stuff and a lot of Albert King stuff, Freddie King, just anything that we could think of. Um, and it became kind of evident after a while which ones were more comfortable for me to sing and play. And we just chose the ones that sounded the best. It was as simple as that, you know. We didn't, uh, we didn't try to choose them for any particular reason at the time. But, <coughs> excuse me, I mean, there were songs like All Your Love, which... I included for from the fact that it was the first track on the John Mayall album that I heard, yes. you know, and it made a big impact on me. So that was like I a little. I listened to it yesterday. Oh, you did? Mr. Album, yes. You did. Good work, yes. Yeah. Well, that's the. Yeah, well, when I heard that first track, you know, and it had a lot of impact on me. So I kind of was a little tribute to that record. I, I included it on this one, and we've actually done it. We've done it as a cross between the John Mayall one and the Otis Rush version. Otis Rush actually wrote the song. Have you heard the Otis Rush version mm -hmm. of this? But it's quite different, it's faster, and it's kind of, it's got these horns on it, going da 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 and it's got this sort of black magic woman feel like Fleetwood Mac almost. So we've kind of done it as a kind of combination of the two, whereas the guitar is more 
uh, five foot to the Eric Clapton version, the rhythms and the horns are more like the Otis Brush version. And hopefully it sounds like me at the end of the day. Yes, because th there are no real big standards in, in the album. There are no real? Uh, the classic of the group, I mean. Uh, well, for Oh Pretty Woman is kind of like, you know, a classic, because for the record that that came from, uh, the Albert King record, Born Under a Bad Sound, there were many classic songs from that record, like The Hunter, which pre covered Oh Pretty Woman, which was covered by a lot of people, uh, the Allman Brothers and John Mayall covered it, uh, and I obviously have covered it now, and there's, what were the other songs? That Born Under a Bad Sound, which Cream did, you know, and Pat Travers did it, and various people, so, a lot of songs came off that one record that was a very important record. Uh, and also, well, I've, I've also done another song from that record called The Years Go Passing By, which is a very slow blues song. That came from the same album. So there was a lot of strong material for one record in the 60s, you know, that was a big record. Did you think of uh, doing only a cover album? I did at first, yeah, because I was too lazy to write all the stuff. I thought, oh, I don't even have to write any songs, I'm going to have a lot of fun here. But then it didn't, it didn't seem like such a good idea. I didn't think it would be, uh, I didn't think people would be able to take it as seriously if I did it all cover versions. Nice. I thought if I wrote some of it, then it would seem more like a Gary Moore record then, as opposed to just doing, you know, like a, a kind of, a, you know, a pin ups type album or something like that. I just thought it would be better if I wrote some of it. So I kind of wrote half the songs at the end of the day. And Hopefully that was the right balance because I still managed to get a lot of my favourite songs and yet come up with something which was me at the same time. So you, so, so you, you think it's uh, as important as an important album as your pre pre previous ones? I think it's more important to me than a lot than a lot of them. Yeah, I mean it depends how you mean important. I mean this uh, this record is very special to me because it's I feel very lucky to have worked with the people that I've worked with on this record and the people that I've admired. For a long time, like Albert King, and is every guitarist's dream to play with Albert King and to work with George Harrison and to play with Albert Collins is also a big honor, you know. And so just from that point of view, it's been a great record for me to make. But just to be able to kind of change direction and to just and to do something because of the music and not no other reason, because it was done in a very honest way. It wasn't done to make money. This record, it was done because that's what I felt like doing. As I said before, I just uh, you know I didn't. I didn't make it for any other reasons, I made it because that's what I felt like doing. So, it, you know, not everybody is in a situation where they're allowed to do that. And sometimes the record company won't let you do that, or sometimes, you know, you haven't sold enough records to justify uh, being in a position to do that, so, you know. And, um, do you, do, do, do you think you, it is as much, uh, do you, do you think you bring something to the blues in doing the, that record? Um, that it's just an MH and MH and not just what? Uh, not to say that, just to, to pay to pay to tribute to, to, to you. Uh, no, I mean, I, I hope that I've put my stamp on it. Because, you know, whatever you play, if you're a musician, you're always going to put your stamp on it, you know. And I think, um, I mean, I don't think this album, I don't think I sound like a lot of other people particularly. I don't think. I say, um, if you look at the people who are making blues albums today, like Stevie Ray Vaughan or Jeff Healy, it doesn't sound like any of those guys. So it must have a sound of its own in that case. It doesn't, you know, it's it still sounds like me, whatever kind of music I'm playing. And this is my version of the blues. Whatever people think of that is another story, but uh, I mean, that's how I interpret blues, and that's the way it's going to come out when I'm playing. Do you listen to uh, the way blues is played in jazz? Like, like I'm busy or... Um, I've never been that crazy about uh, that approach to blues because to me it was always a little bit more technique oriented, you know, and I always felt that, uh, that the blues should be uh, played more simply, you know. Even but I do it. like jazz. I'm not saying that I don't like jazz. I listen to jazz quite a lot, but uh, I just, I prefer it more when it's more simplistic, you know. I like it at the moment, but, you know, maybe in a couple of years' time I might like it more complicated. But uh, I've always preferred the kind of, um, because I grew up on that British blues thing, I suppose it's, you know, it's kind of invaded, it's in my brain and in, inside me, and, and that's the way it's going to stay, so I, when I think of blues, I think of guitars, and I think of 12 bars, and I think of very simple structures. Uh, when I hear it being played by jazz musicians sometimes, I think they get a little bit far away from the essence of what I think blues is, you know, I think, although to them, you see, it may not be to them, they might just be playing from the heart. 
playing from the heart for me would be much more simple than for them because they all they have a lot more harmonic uh, knowledge at their disposal. Uh, so it's just a, it's a different approach, but I prefer it to be more down to earth, please. Um, and so with soul music, wasn't it? Um, uh, there's a bit of the album that comes from stacks to um, of my album. Yes. Yeah, with the horns and everything. Yeah, yes. well, that was that was a deliberate thing. Uh, like on King of the Blues, which I wrote about Albert King, uh, I wanted to go for that kind of stack sound that he went for in the 60s. So we used the four-piece horn section on that, and we tried to arrange the horns uh, and the guitar with that sort of sound, you know, the little kind of, um, the sort of like Steve Cropper type little licks, you know, and, uh, and stuff like that, you know, because uh, it's always been a favourite sound of mine, anyway, I, just, I, li I like the sound of the horns and the guitar together. I think it's got a real soulful kind of sound about it. And uh, I think we managed to capture that up to a certain point with that making it sound like we were just trying to revive that sound. You know, it still sounds like um, it was recorded now because the guitar sound is obviously very different, but yet with that type of um, horn arrangement. And uh, as a songwriter, was it uh, uh, how was it to to try to write the blues with all the woos? That well, that was the, that was the difficult thing because I I, I either had to. Um, try and, you know, duplicate 12 bars that had been written 50 years ago, and I thought that was a bad idea because then it wouldn't sound like I was serious, it would sound like I was just acting it, and it wouldn't really sound for real. So I thought the best way for me to approach it was to do covers of, like, 12 bars and, you know, shuffles that other people had written, and uh, and for me to write more melodic type songs, which is something that I'm more kind of uh, associated with anyway. Uh, so something that would sound like me, but in a blues kind of vein which is what I did, so like songs like Still Got The Blues uh, and uh, Midnight Blues have kind of strong melodies, but they're still bluesy songs, but they're not like, you know, 12 bar sort of boogie sort of things, because there are so many of those that have been written already, so many great ones, that there's no way I was going to do them any better, so I, I just thought I would take a different approach to it, but still, you know, I thought, in other words, I thought I'd write more song type songs and, and, meet, and lead the kind of, um, the, the more kind of raw blues things to the covers. It's about still got the blues. The song it's it's not it's not uh, a blues uh, harmonically. I mean no, but, but uh, it's got the same spirit <coughs> and the blues. So yeah, I mean it's not a million miles away from something like Parisian walkways that I would have written a long time ago, and it has that kind of same kind of um, circular chord sequence. But because of the way the melody works over the top of it, and because of the style of guitar playing and the the chorus and the way the strings are arranged, it has a very bluesy feel. Um, you know, but it's still very simple. The, do you do you feel sometimes close to crooners uh, like Chet Baker or Nat King Cole because on that song it's, it's a bit like that? Mm, no, I, I've never thought about it like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit strange. Yeah. Um, what about it? Because of the string arrangement. I suppose the song because it's a very romantic sort of ballad. Uh, you could interpret it that way, but I, I I think it's a little bit more earthy as well, you know, because it's a bit rougher. It doesn't sound as smooth, maybe, as uh, Nat King Cole, you know, or yeah, I hope. Cole, yeah. Otherwise, I'd better go to Las Vegas. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, yes. Uh, I wasn't thinking about that. But Chip Baker, maybe, more. I don't know if you know him. No, not really, no. Yes. Uh, it's rather for me, like, good, because it's so smooth and with L notes. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, I'm a big fan of soul music, you know. I, I would kind of uh, relate that more to that kind of thing, you know. I've always, yeah. like... So yeah, yeah, you know, and especially like people like Shaka Khan and stuff like that, you know, and uh, Bobby Blue Bland, I like a lot. So, you know, I would say it was closer to that than Nat King Cole. You know, if you listen to the Dreamer album, Bobby Blue Bland, which is where a lot of people, uh, if, you know, like Paul Rogers from Free and David Coverdale got a lot of their phrasing from that record. And you'll hear, in fact, one of the songs in the Ain't No Love in the Heart of the City is a big White Snake song, uh, and it comes from that record. But if you listen to what Bobby Blue Bland is doing, it's very soulful and sometimes it's very smooth and very kind of, you know, lush sounding with the big string section and everything. But it's still very bluesy, you know, and uh, so maybe I was kind of trying to emulate that a little bit. Although the voice is very different, he's got such a great voice, you know. Ooh. By the way, about the voice, isn't it um, a bit uh, weird for an Irish man to sing the blues? Isn't it as difficult as for a Frenchman, for instance? I don't think it's difficult for anyone to sing the blues. Why should <laughs> they? What's the difference? Well, about uh, anyway, just about the voice and the way the vibrato is, the way the culture is. Even. Well, you know, I mean, I think uh, you can have blues in any culture. I mean, it's, it comes from uh, 
I mean, Saji, you know, it be, just because I didn't work in a cotton field. And, yeah, it's uh, really just about, about the form of it. Yeah. Like, you can say, uh, if you're Spanish and you've got the blues, you can sing the flamenco. So, if you sing the blues... No, I see, I don't... Rec it's like it's like saying, you know, um, a rock musician shouldn't play country and western, or... It's like the, all this thing about barriers between music. I don't recognize that. I mean, Peter Green was a, like, 21-year-old 20, Jewish London kid, and he could blow B.B. King off the stage, as far as I'm concerned, on his blues guitar. So, right there is where your theory falls down, you know what I mean? It's like... You know, he wasn't black, he wasn't from the States, but he was, like, one of the greatest blues guitarists you've ever heard. He is one of the greatest blues guitarists you've ever heard. Uh, you know, you, you can listen to people like uh, Van Morrison singing jazz, you know, he comes from Belfast, and he can sing with these big bands. And Louis Stewart comes from Dublin, he's regarded as one of the greatest jazz players around, and yet he's not from New Orleans, and he's not from Chicago, you know, it doesn't really matter. If, you, if you've got it, you've got it. It's like playing guitar at all, or, or doing anything. You've either got a gift for doing it or you haven't, and you can't buy that, you can't learn that, you know, it's something that you can either do or you can't do. And people who can do it don't know why they can do it, they just know that other people can't, that's all. You know, it's not something which you should feel egotistical about, it's something which you, you're lucky to have, really. Um, you know, I think, I think if anybody's got a right to sing blues, it's the Irish people, don't you? <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, so, what, what would you say? Uh, what would you call? What, what? How would you define authentic blues? Um, well, it's you see anything to me which has that kind of mood is blues, whether it's played on acoustic guitar or whether it's played with a you know horn section. It doesn't really matter. But it's just whatever gives you that feeling. And it doesn't have to make you feel bad. I mean, most of the old blues guys will tell you that they play blues to feel good. When they're feeling bad, it makes them feel good to yes. play blues. You know, that's why they started... It comes from a sad feeling. It does come from a sad feeling. That's why, like, those old guys, when, you know, when they were working in the cotton fields picking... That's why they started to sing this stuff to get them through the day, you know, because they were having such a, a miserable time and cutting themselves to pieces picking cotton. And, you know, we don't have any... We can't understand that. We're sitting here in a luxury hotel talking about these guys, but <laughs> at the same time, you can still, you can still appreciate the music, you know, uh, whether you're, uh, you know, rich or poor or, or whatever. I just think... It's it's a feeling that you get from the music which makes it blues, and it doesn't have to be 12 bars. It doesn't have to be, you know, over a, a boogie sort of shuffle beat, or it doesn't have to be over a slow blues feel. It can be anything really, which just gives you that feeling. Uh, it's a certain way the notes come out, and it's a certain way of phrasing things when you sing. You know, it's it's very hard to define really, very hard. That's why not many people can do it, because if you could write it down, we could all just sit down and do it tomorrow, and it's not the way it is. And, uh, do you appreciate um, country, rough country blues like John Lee Hooker's um, yeah. early recordings? No, uh, yeah. An acoustic guitar has been one chord. <laughs> yeah, although, to be honest, my preference is really more towards the Chicago blues. Yes. So with stuff. the horns and... The well, just, well, with the guitar, you know, yeah, I, I like it more when, when it's electric guitar, yeah. you know, from when Buddy Guy started a lot of thing, and then, you know, and all the stuff that came out, Otis Rush, all the stuff that came out of there. And, of course, I, lo I love what Albert King does. I love what, uh, you know, a lot of what BB did, I like Freddie King. Uh, they're all great, I mean, I like the fact that they all sound different and they've all got their own way of playing guitar. And, uh, I suppose really I've always liked more, I've always liked music more that had guitars on it because being a guitarist you tend to think more. Don't you think blues is basically about with the voice, rather? It is, it comes, a lot of it comes from the voice, but then the guitar is secondary to the human voice as far as I'm concerned. It's, um, it's the closest thing for me, to the voice, you know, because you can make a guitar sing. You just can't make it say words, you can't make it talk, and you can't... You can make it talk, but you can't make it um, speak in a particular language, that's what I'm saying. Uh, but you can phrase it the same way as the human voice, and if you're already a singer and you're aware of the inflections in your voice, then you should be able to duplicate those in the guitar, because, you know, you'll notice if you hear it, if you hear Albert King sing, his vibrato in his voice is the same as the vibrato in his guitar. You know, that's the way it works a lot of the time, because it's coming from the same source. It will be interpreted in the same way. And it's uh, something which, uh, you know, it's just something which really just flows through you. You know, it's the same thing, the guitar or the voice, whatever. They're both voices. You try to, to, to practice it, to, to, to put your singing into play? Well, that's what you're supposed to do, I think, when you play blues. I think that's... Um, you know, they say you should try and make the guitar tell a little story, you know, in a way. 
because you know, if you sing a verse, then you take over on the guitar, it should be a continuation almost of what you, what the song is about. You should be thinking about what the song is. You should be trying to convey the mood of the song. You shouldn't just be playing notes to show people how clever you are. Uh, then that applies to all music, I think. I've always had that approach anyway. When you're playing like rock solos, if you're singing a song about war, then you should make it sound like there's a battle going on in the <laughs> solo. It should, it should sound like, you know, you mean business. So if you're playing a beautiful ballad and it's about you know, if, you, if it's about a lost love or something. I've always tried to make the guitar uh, relate to what the song is about. You know, it's not a hard thing to do, you just have to think about it, but a lot of people don't seem to do that, they just... Um, most guitarists I hear seem to be more interested in showing, um, in displaying the scales they've been practicing since last week. You know what I mean? They're more interested in showing you how clever they are and uh, what they learned at the Guitar Institute of Technology the day before or something, or from the uh, Steve Vai instructional tape. You know, so. But that's not music, that's just uh, showing off. But that's okay, I mean, when you're 18, that's what you want to do. You have to prove to people how clever you are and how fast you can play and everything. And that's great, I was exactly the same, but then when you get a bit older, you realise that that's not what it's about. So I suppose you have to go through that to get to that stage. As long as you learn from that, and you know, as long as you do learn that that is not what it's all about, and later on you kind of discover that there is more to music than just showing off. Yeah, um, a bit of technical questions, like Sure. So you play your Les Paul now? No. Uh, I played a Les Paul for most of this record. I used the Strat on two songs. I used the Strat on as the years go passing by and Texas Strat. Uh, the rest of it was a 59 Les Paul. Was it a, a choice or was it just because Pete Green did it, gave, gave it to you? Uh, well, I only used that one on two songs, but I, I have two of them, you say. I've got uh, another... It's another Les Paul. Yeah, I've got another 59, which I bought about a year ago. So that was the one I used on most of this record. Um, because if I play the other one, it sounds like Peter Green all the time, you know, so... It's, and I love that guitar, it's still my favourite all-time guitar. Uh, but it has a certain tone, which, you know, it sounds like it. So I used the other one. And also the frets were fucked up on that one at the time as well, so I couldn't play for the whole record. So the other one was easier to play, and had a different sound, had a lot more, you know, of a kind of, uh, maybe a more modern sound. Uh, so I tended to use that for, for most of the record. And I didn't want to use a Stratocaster for the whole record, although... I really enjoyed playing a strap, but then I, I didn't want it to come out sounding like Stevie Ray Vaughan or Jeff Healy or, you know, if you use a clean sound, then it gets a bit like Robert Craig, because all these American type players are using strats, so I wanted it to sound like a, a more European or British album, so I went more for that traditional blues sound of the Les Paul, which, uh, you know, kind of came out of England in the 60s. I was trying to go back more to that. But I wanted it to sound like it was recorded now. I didn't want it to sound like I was trying to copy what was done then. I wanted it to sound like how maybe the blues breakers would sound if they recorded in the 90s with all the digital equipment and all the technology that's available to us today. So is it why you, you didn't try to, um, to play with a clear sound, for instance? I play with a clear sound on a couple of things, like on um, Midnight Blues, it's got a pretty clear sound, and as the years go passing by, it's got quite a clear sound as well. But uh, it's not me, you know, I mean, it wouldn't really sound, if I, if I made it too clean, it wouldn't really sound like Gary Moore, I don't think. But having said that, you know, uh, the more I work with the great sort of blues guitarists like Albert King, Albert Collins, and the more I think about what they're doing, they have a very clear sound, you know, and, uh, you know, sometimes I feel like maybe I'm hiding behind something, and, you know, one of these days I've got to go throw away the overdrive pedal and put it in the dustbin and, and plug straight into the amp, you know, something I've been thinking about. Didn't you fancy to do an acoustic number? I did. I was trying to write one, but I didn't finish it in time. Uh, and I would have liked to do that, but maybe I'll do one on stage, you know, because I, I like playing acoustic guitar, I've always enjoyed it. Uh, and I started to write one that like, was like, uh, a very big epic song with a 12 string with some slide on it, uh, a song called Mission of Mercy. But then it, it kind of um, seemed to me that it would fit better in one of my rockier albums because it had that big sound and it needed the big production and everything, whereas this album is a much more raw sounding record. So I thought I'd keep that one, but it's, I think it could be a really good song and it incorporates the blues feel and plus the Celtic elements as well all into one song. So that could be something interesting. Yeah. And what are the, the amps for, for the album? Uh, well, I started off with a little 50 watt Marshall top, you know, the, uh, the JTM 45 reissue, which is the Blues Breakers amp. 
which they've now made again from the 90s and with a, an Electra voice, with a, a 412 Marshall cabinet with, with Electra voice speakers. And whichever amps I used on the album, they all went through the, uh, the same cabinet. So if I used a Fender amp, I would put it through the Marshall cabinet with the Electra voice speakers, or if I used it. Marshall or a Soldano amplifier. Have you seen Soldano amplifiers? Dynamo. Dynamo. It's called Soldano S O L D A N O. It's a new American amplifier which is all hand built and it's like um it's like a supercharged Marshall in a way. Um it's kinda like uh, you can get a lot of distortion from it but with a very bright kind of Marshall sound. Uh so I've been using that. It's a really good amp actually. It's, a, it's something I, I used to do on walking so by myself. So you didn't uh, plug direct to, to the console like you did before? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't make that mistake this time. You think it's a mistake? Well, you know, when I did it on... The, you mean like on the G4 record? Yeah. Is that what you mean? You know, that sounded so good in the studio when I did it, but when I heard it on the record, I really hated that sound. It, it sounded like a wasp or something, you know. And, uh, <laughs> do you know what I mean? A bit like a, a wasp in a, a honey jar or something buzzing around. Uh, it's very hard to get the right sound straight into the, the console, as I've discovered ever since. Even when you put enough effects on it, you can fool yourself in the control room that it sounds good. I did it on the loner also, that was direct, you know, when I did the loner on uh, the Wild Frontier album. Yes. That was well, actually that through, is. yeah, you know the Galleon Kruger amplifiers? Yes. Uh, yes well, I used Kruger, to just take yes. just a head, they make a head as well, and I used one of those, yeah. and I took a, a feed out of that into the desk and we put some repeats on it. Because that was what I used to use at home for writing on all the time. I always used to have that and put it into my desk at home, no speakers, no micing up or anything. Uh, but, you know, it, I think you get a much more natural tone when you mic it up. It sounds much more like it's in a real room. It's got a bit more space to the sound. You can't Did duplicate you, the sound of a speaker moving out. Did you uh, use any effects on the other? Uh, not much, no. I didn't use, uh, only, uh, I used the Marshall Governor pedal. Sometimes when I use the overdrive. Yeah, just the overdrive. I really like that pedal actually. Yeah, it's it's got more overdrive than uh, what I normally use to. Normally I use a, an Ibanez classic tube screamer, which is still uh, the one that I've been using for a long time. That's the one that I really like to use on stage. Uh, but just those two pedals really. I didn't use much else, no chorus or anything. And what about the, the strings? Yeah, I, I used strings. Yes. <laughs> yes, I used to. You mean the gauges? Uh, yes, the gauges. Yeah, I used the Markley strings, and they were uh, 10 to 52. So it's 10, 13, 17, 30, 40, 2, 52. It's uh, heavy for, for what? For some people, yeah. Uh, yeah, but I learned to play on a terrible guitar, I told you. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to use the heavy strings, otherwise they feel too light to me. You know, I mean, some people get a great sound using light strings. Eddie Van Halen uses lighter strings, and the first time I picked his guitar up, I thought, oh, you know. <laughs> But so you can get a fat sound, obviously, from light strings because he's proved that. But uh, I just uh, I like it when they feel a bit tighter because on stage you've got a lot more energy, you know, and you start really going for it on your strings and they flap around too much. It feels, it's like when I had this Paul Reed Smith guitar, you know, it sounded really good in the studio, but when I got on stage, it felt too easy to play, you know, it was too easy and it didn't hit right back enough. So I need a bit of resistance there to make it feel like I'm really giving it some, you know, playing something solid. Stage. And uh, the guitar picks? Uh, yeah. Well, they're, they're kind of a copy of, you know, the Fender Heavies? No. Uh, well, the Fender Heavy pick, it's a very hard pick, uh, you know, triangle shape, teardrop shape, whatever you call it. And uh, like a tortoise shell type pick, and Ibanez made me thousands of those, so I used those before, and then someone else made me some other ones which are similar. So it's just based on the Fender Heavy, but anything which is close to that is okay. And um, how did uh, Albert King and uh, uh, how, how do they behave in the studio, uh, I mean, with uh, modern techniques? Uh, well, I mean, Albert Collins just came in. He was actually working in London at the time at the Town and Country Club, and he just came down and played with me uh, at very short notice, and we did the song in two takes, and it was great fun. And he was only in the studio for about an hour and a half, you know, and that was see you around, by and we <laughs> met before, and it was, it was great. And he was very easy for me to work with. Albert King uh, had to actually come here from the States, and he had never heard of me or anything. I was just some guy, you know, that asked him, to, you know, the record company asked him to come over and he said uh, he'd do it for what he thought was a lot of money so that we would say no. And we said, okay, so he had to do it then, you know, so he got himself in trouble. And uh, basically he walked into the studio and said, so what have you got then? You know, I want to hear this shit. And he was very like, oh, you know, he made me feel about this size. And I was really like scared of the guy because he's a big guy anyway, but apart from anything, he's such a legend as a blues player and it's like, here's me, this sort of white kid in London, you know, trying to... 
kind of like, you know, rip off all his licks or whatever. And uh, he, he, he said, okay, I want to hear this stuff, you know. And so he put the type of old pretty woman on. And it was on for about 10 seconds. And he said, stop the tape, stop the tape. He said, see that line there, son? I said, what line? He said, sure is the rising sun. Not she is the rising sun. Sure is the rising sun. So I got one of the sure. sure it, it's, it, I got one of the words wrong. I sang yeah. she instead of sure, and so he was really pissed at me. <laughs> and I said, well, listen, you know. I said, I'm really sorry, and he gave me such shit about it all night long. Every time the tape would play again, he was learning his part. He'd lift his glasses and <laughs> sure is the rising sun. Not she. <laughs> He's giving me a real hard time. I said, look. I listen to your fucking records, you know. I can hear you. The, uh, I said, next time, tell them to mix your voice. I said, tell them to mix your fucking voice up so I can hear it. And he said, it's on there, it's on there. I said, well, I couldn't fucking hear it. I've been listening to this for a week and I couldn't hear this one word and you're busting my balls over it. I said, you know, I hope you like something I fucking do, you know. But then he was great and we had a good time. We, we were in the studio for like three days together and we made the video together. And we had good fun, you know. I mean, he's a great old guy. He's such a character. He's so... Now he's got some great stories to tell. You know. We used to just sit around. We'd have like dinner, you know. We'd been working all day. We'd have a dinner break. And we'd sit around for three hours just talking to him. And he'd just sit there and he'd go, Yeah, I remember 1959. I was in Mississippi. He'd tell you all these great stories. And No, it wasn't. It was 63. No, it was 59. You know, it's like, like, he's 67 years old, this guy, you know. Awesome player. Fuck, you know, if you hadn't had Albert King, you wouldn't have had Eric Clapton, you wouldn't have had Jimi Hendrix, because he influenced those guys so much, you know, this long bending stuff. You can hear it. You listen to Strange Brew by Eric Clapton, it's the solo from Pretty Woman. Almost the sound, you know. It's like, and you listen to what Hendrix was doing. Listen to Red House, and it's all on there. Yeah, yeah fuck. What mm. about uh, George Harrison? How did you meet him? Well, I've known George. He's like a friend. We've known each other for about four or five years since I moved out of town. He lives about five minutes away from where I live. And I used to just see him around and stuff, but uh, we'd never really worked together seriously. We jammed a little bit and stuff, but uh, at the end of the last tour, I told him I was doing this blues album. He said he had this one song that I might be interested in, and he gave me a tape of it. And uh, he'd actually given it to Eric Clapton at one point, and he hadn't used it. And so the tape that I have is a demo of Eric Clapton singing it. Right. Yeah, Just I'm selling it, actually. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. To the highest bidder and putting it up for auction and stuff. <laughs> so he gave me the tape and I just uh, I went to him and listened to it and I said, yeah, I'd like to do it. I said, but I want you to play on it, you know, if I do it. And he said, okay. So he's got like a 24 track in his house. And we went up there and we just put a lindrum uh, pattern down, just a steady rhythm, and uh, we put some rhythm guitars over it. And George played his slide guitar parts and the harmony slides, and we did some backing vocals. And then I took the tape away, and uh, then I replaced all the stuff except. Uh, the guitars, I put a new bass and new drums and just built it up from there. Then we had Nicky, Nicky Hopkins, who's a real 70s and 60s yeah, keyboard player. Hopkins, yeah. Yeah. Is, is he the one who plays um, in all the albums? No, there's three keyboard players. Uh, there's Mick Weaver and there's Don Airy and Nicky Hopkins. Nicky plays the solo one as the years go passing by. And he also plays on George's song, that kind of woman. Uh, but then, like, Mick Weaver plays on uh, All Your Love, plays Hammond Organ on that, and he plays on Walker. Mick Weaver, it's W-E-A-V-E-R. That's it, you got it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to be able to spell yes. it. If you get stuck with any of the spellings, just ask me, I'll help you out. So it doesn't look, you know. Uh, but uh, then Don Airy played a lot of the stuff as well. He played on, uh, like, Don, two, two, Don Airy, A A I R E Y. He's someone that, I've worked with him a lot. He was in policy and tour with me. And he was in uh, Rainbow, and he was in Ozzy Osbourne's band, yes. and uh, who else did he play with? Jeff Rotol, I think, was the last band he was in. He's been in a lot of different bands. But Don's a great player, and he's also like a good arranger. He helped me arrange the horns and strings, and he's like going to be my musical director for the tour, you know. So, so you will do a tour? Yeah. Mm. So, what will you play? Uh, uh, all blues, nothing else. All blues? Yeah. Nothing, nothing from your no. previous album? No. Just oh. blues. So anyone that wants to come, be prepared for the worst. You know, but so oh. well, you know, I mean, if I'm being honest about it, I can't play, uh, you know, Pretty Woman and then out in the fields after it because it's going to work. You know, it doesn't sound right, and it's a, it's a totally different band this time. We've got a four-piece horn section. Uh, you know, the different types of musicians. So it's like it just wouldn't sound right to play all the Irish stuff with the blues stuff. You know, it wouldn't be right. So uh, 
If anyone wants to come and hear some blues, be my guest. But don't shout for the other songs. So you'll have to, to, um, to choose new songs or those yeah. songs other classics? Or? Yeah, we'll have to find some more material, but uh, there's plenty to choose from. We only need to learn about uh, six new songs. Um, when will you do that too? Well, we start at the end of April and it goes through May to the beginning of June. And it's all Europe at the moment. We haven't done any further. Are you going to France? We finish on the last day is Paris. Mm. Is that where you live, Paris? Yes. Uh -huh. Well, we didn't get to play Paris <laughs> in the last tour. Uh, we were supposed to play Paris last time, but something happened with the, the venue. Uh, where is it? We used to play Zenith. Zenith? Zenith, yes. Yeah, we used to play there. And uh, we were supposed to play there last time, but the ballet took over the venue, so we couldn't get it. Uh, and then we couldn't change the date, so we never got to play France last time, which is a shame. We actually like going to Paris. Yeah, I like them. Yeah, yeah. I've always liked them. Uh, what and what, uh, what? What could be your next album? Oh, you told me. <laughs> 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 I've no got a clue. Yeah, I really, really don't know. Have, yeah. Maybe it'll be a, a jazz bebop, Celtic, <laughs> Celtic acid, Kaylee uh, rock blues <laughs> album. I, <don't> know. <laughs> I really don't know. Yes, you know, it's a big decision, really, isn't it? You know, so, we'll have to see what happens. Uh -huh. Depends how this one's received, I suppose. Yes. Um, um, yes, about, by the way, about um, those guys who play scales and so fast, like Manstein and, and Safir. And, you know, I interviewed Manstein and he's a, a great fan of Hendrix. It's so surprising. Um, well, not really. I mean, he's a great fan of Richie Blackmore as well. Yes. You know. Yes. Same kind of era. No, he played Spanish Castle Magic on his last album. Did he? Yes. Yeah, was it good? It's, it's really strange to hear him play. It's like... Well, you know... Yeah, we would have. You know, the thing is, not everybody, you know... Like, when we were along, guitarists sometimes play totally different when they're in their homes, you know, whatever. Uh, I mean, I found myself playing blues all the time when I was alone. It just kind of made me think, maybe this is what I'm supposed to be playing, you know, <laughs> because... It seems strange to be playing one type of music on stage, but I mean, you know, a lot of musicians like listening to other types of music, so it stands to reason that they'll play other styles when, uh, you know, when they're by themselves. So maybe, you know, maybe he has another side to him that people don't realise. Somebody told me he's a good blues player. Yes, uh, Manson, he played a, a bit of blues in his last live album. Did he? Yes. From Russia, isn't he? Uh, yes. Yeah. Is he good? Well, it's him most of the times, most of the time. Oh, like solo stuff? It's special, yeah. There's a lot to, to talk about. But, um, yes, what what is interesting in, in that record is that uh, one can hear him playing a bit of blues. Yeah. Um, oh, I have to have a listen to that. He's rehearsing... Uh, it's not really authentic. Yeah, it's not what? It's not authentic, of course. Doesn't no, well, I mean, but, you know... But it's interesting because it's at least chill. Yeah. yeah. I expect it would be very hard for him to slow down enough to play those. Uh, I don't think he's slow down enough. <laughs> he didn't slow, he still played it fast, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He's a good player. And, uh, yes, by the way, do you think uh, there can be a um, continuing of blues in heavy metal? In heavy metal? Yeah. I think that influence will always be there because, you know, all the lyrics are almost like blues lyrics anyway. They're all about fucking and screwing. <laughs> Drinking and you know whatever anyway, so that's the same approach really. About the music. Yeah, you know. As long as, long as long as you know bands like Bad Company have an influence in Led Zeppelin, yeah, there'll always be some kind of blues influence there. Yeah. You know, there's, a, there's been a lot of bands with that sort of feel, like Foreigner even people like that. It's all kind of crossbreeds of Bad Company and Led Zeppelin. And I think it's easy top. Oh, definitely it's easy top. Yeah, you know, and they've had a lot of influence on a lot of people. So. Uh, I think the blues is always going to be there in some form. Sure. Even Motorhead. Motorhead? Yes. I don't see a lot of blues influence in Motorhead, but, yeah, but Lemmy actually likes blues a lot. You know, I, I there don't. are some 12 bar Motorhead songs, you know. Oh, yeah? yeah. Well, I haven't listened Just to them enough. I only know the real right. fast stuff. But I know he likes blues. You know, he used to be Hendrix's roadie. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, he's well into it. And the, by the way, the guy who was before me knew him because he was a Queen's Holy with him. Yeah? Really? Yeah. A small world. Yes. <laughs> but uh, Lemmy, uh, I know he's, he's very into it, but he was talking about doing an album and getting a little bit of people to play on it. 
you know, people like different musicians. Do you know Lenny? Yeah, sure, everybody knows Lenny. <laughs> <laughs> you can't go for a drink in London without knowing Lenny. You must know that. <laughs> He's a great guy, I love him, he's great, because, uh, you know, most of the new bands, the kids now are really boring, you know, and like, Lemmy's one of the old school, he's a real character. You need people like that in the rock business, otherwise it'd be so fucking boring. He's great, you know, and he's, he's a very intelligent guy, everyone just thinks he's a joke, but, you uh, when you talk to Lemmy, he's a very wise person, you know, he knows what's happening. Yeah. Can you write music? How can you write music? Can you write music? Oh, no, I don't write, I don't actually write it in school, but no, I just, uh, I just put it on tape and then uh, I give the tape to the band and then they learn it and that's it. Or else I just teach people, you know, from guitar and just tell them the chords. No, I can't write it. I went to learn musical theory when I was just starting, but the teacher never turned up most of the time. He didn't used to show up. So one Saturday the teacher wouldn't be there and the next Saturday I wouldn't be there. So we never <laughs> actually met more than once. And then I thought, I'm, I don't think I'm really meant to learn musical theory. Because I just didn't like the idea of it, you know. I, I was progressing so fast by ear, you know, by learning by ear, that I just didn't want to stop and think about it, really. That's the, but, you know, sometimes I regret it and sometimes I think it doesn't matter. You know, when it comes to, like, string arrangements and stuff, I wish I could, because then I wouldn't have to ask someone else to do it for me. But then that's a different story again. You, have, you can't just learn to arrange by knowing how to read. You've got to, you've got to learn to arrange as well, I suppose. You still have to learn that. But, there are times when I wish I could read, but when I've been working with my jazz musicians and stuff, uh, I had to just, you know, do it all by ear, whereas they would have to explain things to me sometimes. But it hasn't really held me back, to be honest. It's not something I'm really worried about too much. If I was a session man, it would be different. Yeah. Even when you do sessions, you're going to have to read most of the time. If you've got a good ear, you can read chord charts. I used to be able to read chord charts very really easily. So that wasn't too bad, but I've never been able to read single notes very well. You read music? Yes, I do. So you play yourself? Yes, yeah. I just have a guitar and piano. Uh -huh. yes. Do you have a band? Uh, in, yes, we begin with friends. Yeah. For the moment, yes. What kind of music do you play? Oh, we're playing, <laughs> uh, uh, we're playing a bit of Hendrix numbers, yeah. just to jump for the beginning. But we're also playing very, try to do a bit of funny songs. It's really strange. <laughs> <laughs> like there's, there's one song called uh, I Saw Your Mother at the Supermarket. Yeah. It's totally absurd, like that. Yeah. It's, it's strange. <laughs> I'll have to hear it. So we try to have fun. But, uh, <laughs> it's all about. <laughs> yes. It's all about. And do you play a Stratocaster? Or, uh, yes. Yes. Much <laughs> good if you're playing him with stuff. It's good to play. Yes. And to, don't forget to tune it down. Eh? Yes, yes, but uh, we, we have to tune all together. So. And you have a fuzz space? You have, to, you have to have a fuzz space, you know? Yes. You know a fuzz space? What? Uh, fuzz, ah, yes. Fuzz space, it's yes. called. And the wah You know, like the pedal he used to yes. use, the round it's pedal? Yes, baby, uh, wah -wah. Yeah, uh, on the fuzz space. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they that's, that's sound terrible now when you try to play through those things. But, uh, he got a good sound out of it. I don't know that, oh, by the way. Hmm? Because I'm the interviewer. <laughs> Uh, by the way, but uh, George Harrison, um, were the Beatles uh, important for you I mean, at the time? And was George Harrison, uh, uh, how do you consider him as a guitar player? Oh, well, he was my favorite guitarist at one time. When I started, he was, like, as far as I was concerned, there wasn't anybody better. He was the guy who, I mean, I've always really admired the fact that he could um, play a solo in the middle of a song for like eight bars, something very short. And, you know, it would stick in your mind and it would always be part of the song. That's what I was talking about before. That's very much the George Harrison approach. And he would always come up with something that you would never think of every time. Um, you know, just a bit of a genius, really, I think, on the guitar. He's a very underrated guitarist. He's a great slide player. People don't realize how good he is, you know. And he sits down in the studio with you and you're sitting there and he's playing all these great things. And it's like, he's such a clean player, you know. He gets a good, really clear sound. And, you know, he likes to work out what he wants to do. He likes to know what he's playing. He's not a real improviser, but once he knows it, then he gets it in one or two takes. He's very, I mean, very professional, but high standard player. And uh, yes, uh, what uh, it was Texas Trips? Um, it was what Texas Trips? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Is it a parody of Stevie Rogan's style? It's not a parody. It's a kind of a compliment. You know, it's a meant to. Yeah. yeah, it's it's got a sense of humour, but it's not it's not meant to be laughing at him. It's you know, it's just kind of saying that I like what they do. Those guys. It mentions ZZ Top and it mentions Stevie Ray Vaughan and it mentions Albert Collins. So it's just a kind of a tribute to that whole Texas style. But it's done very sort of tongue in cheek, you know, as we say. Do you know, understand tongue in cheek? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Yes. So I think there's many more questions. Um. Yes. Yeah, so uh, what, which uh, next one? No, it's okay. Was about which is your 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 favorite blues album that maybe you you, you uh born under a bad sign by Albert King I think at the moment the one which one born under a bad sign by born Albert under King. a bad sign yeah. yes yeah that's the one I find myself listening to a lot okay <laughs> <laughs> it's okay oh thank you very much.